you have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, looking at chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 19 uh, going through verse 26. So it's John chapter 4, beginning with the 19th verse. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, and it is now here. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father seeks such as these to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called the Christ. When He comes, He will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with and for me in this time? Heavenly Father, we are grateful, O Lord, for your grace at work in us. I pray that you would use this stammering tongue to proclaim your message of grace, of love, of worship in spirit and truth this day. For we ask it in your name, Jesus. Amen. It was April 14th, 1912, at about 10 p.m. That's about the time, somewhere right around there, where a small ship known as the Titanic struck an iceberg. And in four hours' time, sank beneath the sea. There's a story that one woman who actually made it onto a lifeboat, who was getting ready to push off away from the ship, she asked if she could go back to her stateroom. She was given only three minutes to do so. And so she did. She hurried down the corridors, and the ship was already uh, starting to list or, or to... Um, head nose down some, so it was kind of treacherous. She got to her, her to her room, and there she saw really her a lot of her wealth, the jewelry she had brought along on the trip. And she looked at it, and then quickly turned her gaze to what she had come for, and that was she snatched up three oranges and a little bit of other food, and then made her way back to the lifeboat. One hour before, the author said, she would have naturally chosen the diamonds over oranges. But when in the face of death, values are seen more clearly. You know, this week, as we have begun a, a new school year, and I know all our uh, school age uh, children and youth are just excited about homework and things like that, right? Okay, maybe not. But I thought as we, as we launch this, uh, this uh, new school year, I always like to do kind of a, a back-to-school series. And, and this year, you know, many of you have heard me talk about uh, core values in church. And I believe that there are really four core values that every church has to have to be a church. Um, for full disclosures, these are not all original to me, okay? Okay. Um, but after 20 plus years of being a pastor, after talking with people in the church, both clergy but and laity, I keep coming back to these four things. And, uh, and if you forget them, uh, don't worry. Caroline Buckley was kind enough to put them on the bulletin board right outside the parlor so you can look there for a refresher. You know, Bob Logan talks about values in church. He said values are often unwritten assumptions that guide our actions. Values demonstrate our convictions and priorities. 
Values are confirmed by our actions, not just our words. Values are not a doctrinal statement. They are convictions that determine how a church operates. Values provide the foundation for formulating goals and setting the direction of a church's ministry. Core values are the key statements that reflect the distinctives of a church. Key issues for determining your core values. Here's one. If the church were really the church, what would it be doing? That's a great question to ask. If the church were really the church, what would it be doing? Core value number one. Authentic worship. Authentic worship. You know, you, you've probably been someplace, and you may even have them in your home. Uh, there, you know, some sort of a fruit or something. It, it looks delicious. Um, but when you pick it up, you can pretty quickly tell um, it might not be what you think. Here's a great example I found in the parlor, or in the kitchen. Anybody want to take a bite of one of these? Have you ever been to, to somebody's home or maybe in your house and you got you know the, the little plastic fake fruit, you know what I'm talking about? It looks good. It's the right shape. It's about the right size. It's got the right color and everything. But would you really want to take a bite of that? I don't think so. Why? Because it's not real. It's fake. In today's passage, Jesus speaks with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. Uh, in the series, The Chosen, and I know uh, one of our Sunday school classes is working through The Chosen, there is a great segment about this conversation. If I had screens in here, I would show it because it, it was depicted so well. Um, but in this conversation... The Samaritan woman says to Jesus, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you say that the place where, we, where people must worship is Jerusalem. Again, Jesus and the Samaritan woman, they're, they're standing at Jacob's well. It's on Mount Gerizim. And off in the distance, on the same hillside, you can see the ruins of of the Samaritan temple site that had been built there right around the time of the exile that would have been between 600 to 500 BC. It was destroyed by the Israelites themselves during the Maccabean time period. That's the time period between the Old and New Testaments. It was right around 110 BC. The Maccabeans who were Israelites destroyed this temple. Jews and Samaritans worshiped the same God, yet the Jews destroyed the Samaritan temple because they said, no, you've got to worship in Jerusalem. There was real tension between Jewish people and the Samaritans. They hated one another. They fought each other a lot. And the Samaritan wo woman's comments are really sarcastic in many ways. Yeah, you think you're better than us because your people destroyed our temple. And Jesus' response is essentially to say, look, worship is not about location. Here in John's Gospel, Jesus is making it known early on that the temple in Jerusalem, its time is coming when it will cease to exist. And God's people, this is you and I, and all who call upon the name of Jesus, we will worship the Lord differently. It won't be in a temple, it, but we will worship in spirit and truth. Authentic worship is not about some specific location. Yes, we gather in a sanctuary. That is true. I've had authentic worship on a basketball court in a gymnasium. I've experienced authentic worship at a football stadium when Billy Graham gave uh, one, one of his, his sermons. You can have authentic worship in a lot of places as long as it's always directed to God. We worship in spirit and in truth. Warren Wiseby, in his book, The Integrity Crisis, 
tells this. He says, true biblical worship so satisfies our total personality that we don't have, have to shop around for man-made substitutes. He said, William Temple made this clear in his masterful definition of worship. William Temple says this, for worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by his holiness, the nourishment of the mind with his truth, the purifying of imagination by his beauty, the opening of the heart to his love, the surrender of will to his purpose. When we think of authentic worship in those terms, we see that real worship is not about building, it's not about location, it's not about style, whether you're using an, an organ or whether you're using guitars and drums. It's not about hymns or praise and worship songs. It's not about traditional versus contemporary. It's not about the lighting in the sanctuary. It's not about whether we use screens or use a hymnal. Actually, I've known many churches who use both. It's about connecting with Jesus and submitting to him. The, a man, he's, he's in charge of Seabed, which is a publishing company that was founded by uh, Asbury Seminary, where Lori and I went. His name's J.D. Walt. And I love his statement about worship. He says, you know, we could do everything right. You know, the, basically, all the music could be played perfectly. We could all sing in perfect harmony. The, the, the sermon would be perfect in, in its eloquence and in the words that are used. But if people do not connect with Jesus, we fail. The reverse is also true. You know, we, we could have the choir sing one song and have the congregation sing a completely different song to a completely different tune. That might not sound good. I could literally tr fall off here. Hope I don't. Come close a few times. Yeah, everything could like go wrong, but if people experience Jesus, we succeed. It's about experiencing God. If we just gather here and run through the motions, we miss it. If we come to this place because it's the cultural thing to do, we miss it. If we sing the hymns, pray the Lord's Prayer, listen intently to the Holy Scriptures read aloud and proclaimed, and yet never allow God the Holy Spirit to move in our souls, we miss it. I think about the words of Pastor Chuck Swindoll. In one of his sermons, he said, What then is the essence of worship? It is the celebration of God. When we worship God, we celebrate Him. We extol Him. We sound His praises. We boast in Him. Worship is not the casual chatter that occasionally drowns out the organ prelude. We celebrate God when we allow the organ, the prelude to attune our hearts to the glory of God by the means of music. Worship is not the mumbling of prayers or the mouthing of hymns with little thought and less heart. We celebrate God when we join together earnestly in prayer and intensely in song. Worship is not the self-aggrandizing words or boring cliches. One is asked when given a testimony. We celebrate God when all parts of the service fit together and work to a common end. Worship is not the grudging gifts or compulsory service. We celebrate God when we give to Him generously and serve Him with integrity. Worship is not haphazard music done poorly. Not even great music done merely as a performance. We celebrate God when we enjoy and participate in music to His glory. Worship is not a distracted endurance of the sermon. We celebrate God as we hear His Word gladly and seek to be conformed by it more and more to the image of our Savior. 
Worship is not the hurried motions of a tacked on Lord's table. We celebrate God when we fellowship greatly at the ceremonial meal that speaks so centra- centrally of our faith in Christ who died for us, who rose again on our behalf, and who is a return for our good. So this day, as we worship, let's not give something fake to God. Let's be authentic. It's not about what we get out of the service, really and truly more. When we come, we are worshiping the Lord. We are giving to God. God is the object of our worship. So this day, let us worship authentically from the core of our hearts and give him the praise. Let us pray together. Jesus, we are thankful, Lord, for you and for the grace you give us. Here and now as we prepare to partake of Holy Communion, we pray your blessing to be upon us. May we worship you in spirit and truth. Amen.